am Marissa. And I am Jordan. Today we'll be discussing a topic from the year 1915. What will you be talking about today, Jordan? Today, I'll be talking about the Armenian Genocide of 1915. So, when you think of Armenians, what do you think of? Kardashians. Why? Because they're hairy. <laughs> hairy? I would think because they have Ian at the end of the name. Is that why? Well, most people with I A N, Yan in E N. Oh, really? Anything Yan? Yeah, a lot of a lot of the names end in A N. Just something I've noticed. Not one hundred percent, but if it ends in I A N and it's a name you're not familiar with, it's probably a Midian. Maybe. So besides Kardashians, any other one? The singer of System of a Down. Yeah. Is Serge, he Armenian? Serge Tankian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, the whole band's are many. I'm actually I'm going to talk about them soon. Oh, okay. Um, Doctor Kavorkian. He's Armenian. Yeah. Hmm. Kavorkian. See, I A N. Yeah. What's yeah. Serge's last name? Tankian, or oh, Tankian. Okay. Yeah, just a little bit of information. Yeah, there. I don't know much about Armenia. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you mentioned Sister Women Down. It's funny because like when I was in school, like I never even heard of the Armenian genocide. I don't think anyone did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we weren't taught about that. Yeah, we weren't taught no. about. We talked about, of course, the genocide, World War II, Nazis, Jews, Hotel Rwanda. We know about that. But this one was kind of like kept hush hush. And so, you know, decades before the genocide of the Jews, Hitler was actually inspired by the Armenian genocide. Hitler was inspired by a, a by a lot of ugly things. Yeah. Like the eugenics program in the United mm-hmm. States. We talked about that a few episodes ago. And I'm going to be talking about a little bit of eugenics in Turkey. Oh, okay. I with, guess it was just popular at that time? Well, the, they kind of started the eugenics with the Armenian people. Um, and I'll tell you about that soon. Okay. So the first time I actually heard about the Armenian genocide was actually in 2001. And it was the summer before 9-11. And I remember seeing this band on Conan O'Brien in 1998. But, you know, they're like wild and crazy. And the sound and the performance, it was very weird, but I didn't know what they were because it was back in TV. And if you missed it, you missed it. And if you didn't tape record it, then it's gone forever. Yeah. And, you know, I thought about this band a lot for a few years, but I couldn't remember the name of them. And, you know, I didn't have internet and no reference to connect them. So it wasn't until summer of 2001, I was watching VH1 and I saw this promo for a new album. And it showed like little clips of them playing. I'm like, oh, that's a band I saw on Conan. And of course, it just happened to be System of a Down. And they were promoting the Toxicity album. And once I got that band name, I found out, you know, where they were. And I searched for their music. And, you know, Toxicity album didn't come out at the time, but I got their first album. Now, when I was listening to that album, I found out that song that I heard on Conan was called Spiders. Well, all the, in that whole album, they're just talking about genocide, a whole race genocide, Armenian genocide. Like, they keep talking about it. And that's when I'm, like, looking it up for the first time. And I knew nothing about that until that album. And so... They play a huge part in pop culture when it comes to talking about it because they're very much activists in that. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit because a lot of people who are familiar with you know, genocide of 1915 probably found out about it from them. Mm. And, and, there's, and lately there's been a few movies, the movie The Promise. And, you know, I was gonna, I'll talk to you about it more as we go on. But a lot of movies and things aren't allowed because the Turkish government shuts it down. They threaten. And I'll tell you about that more as we go. But I have to say, once this episode is released, I'll never be able to go to Turkey. Why? Because I'll be on their watch list. Oh, please. No, I'm serious. We have like two listeners. No, we've got four now. <laughs> and a Patreon or a patron Patreon. Oh, did we get a new one? No, not a new one, but we got one from last. I'm still th- thinking about that one from last week. Get Ryan character. We're still riding on that one? Yeah, oh, I okay. am. All right. Yeah, this was for you, Ryan. <laughs> so, so why do you say that, that you're not going to be allowed? Well, because... If you talk negatively about the Turkish government or talk about it as a genocide, it makes them look bad. And they are still in denial there is a genocide. It's been over 100 years. Yeah. And they're still in denial. 105 years. And that's the thing. The whole point, the reason why this topic is so controversial is because it's frowned upon to them. They will, they don't want to call it a genocide. They want to call it like, oh, well, it was just a A disagreement, a casualty of war. (laughs) Um, it was just something that happened. And yeah, and it's really unfortunate because I really want to go and see Istanbul. Mm-hmm. I want to see what was once known as uh, Constantinople, which is really rich in history. And, you know, Romans occupied it and the Ottoman Empire. 
And in between that, um, I forgot who it was. Someone else briefly occupied that. But that was like one of the most important places in history. Yeah. In modern history. I'll talk more about that later. But on the 24th of April, 1915, the Turkish government, which was known as the Ottoman authorities, rounded up, arrested, and deported from Constantinople. They rounded up about 235 to 270 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders and murdered the majority of them. So these are the people who are the respected leaders, intellectuals of the Armenian community. Mm -hmm. They arrested them all and then killed most of them. Why? I'll get to all of that in a minute. Okay. There's a lot of reasons. <laughs> the The simple answer to that is they didn't like Armenians and they wanted to get rid of them all. They just simply didn't like them. Armenians are a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Of course, Turkish are Muslim. They didn't want them there. They just simply didn't like They, they were racist towards them. They hated them openly. They were treated as third class citizens. So nothing in their history happened between them that made them dislike them no it's just uh they always felt that they were they were a threat because they were different the ottoman empire always had authority over them mm -hmm. and power over them and they made sure of that but they they looked at them as like a pest we just need to get rid of them and so they kind of waited for world war one to happen as an excuse like well all this stuff's going on it sounds like what hitler did to the jews yeah exactly we're, they're they're an inconvenience or a pest. They're they're inferior. Yeah. We need to just get rid of them. They're they're just a pest. They're taking our jobs. They're doing this. They're they're being an inconvenience. We just need to get rid of them. And that's what the Turkish the Ottoman Empire thought of the Armenians. And that's a simple answer. Their answer is a little more complicated than that. So this genocide was carried out during World War One. At the end of it, the Turkish government ended up killing, murdering, I should say, one point five million ethnic Armenians until the year 1923. Wow. So a million of them were in that first year, 1915. So and they just dragged out the rest until 1923? Yeah, the, you remember we meant, I mentioned uh, pogroms yeah, in an yeah. episode? Mm -hmm. So there were a bunch of those from 1915 until 1923 where they just, you know, they were doing small ethnic cleansing. But for the majority were killed in 1915, about a million wow. Armenians were killed. And the way they did it, of course, you when I tell you about it, you'll see a lot of similarities with World War II and what Hitler did. And he was, like I said, very inspired by a lot of it. So the genocide implemented in two phases, the wholesale killing of able-bodied male population through massacre and subjection after the army used them for forced labor, along with deportation of women, children, and the elderly. Doesn't it sound familiar? Mm -hmm. So they worked them to death. And then when they were no longer useful, they killed them. And the series of death marches leading them into a Syrian desert. So they marched them into the desert and abandoned them. And they were starved, deprived of water, robbed, raped, and executed. While the rest were just left to slowly die. So they put them out on trains. I'll get to where they get the train from and, and the railroad soon. This was the very first genocide that we know of in modern history. And the word wasn't even coined until 1943. So the word genocide didn't exist. It was something that was coined by Raphael Lemkin. And he created the word to create laws against governments committing these acts. So you can get away with it because there's no law saying you can't do it. So why not, right? That's crazy. It's like how they have new internet laws. You know, they have to create them as they go. Mm -hmm. So it's always like, oh, we don't have a law for that. So we have to create a law. So there's so much you can get away with, with right now. So Turkey, of course, denies that the word genocide is an accurate term for these crimes and likes to hide behind the fact that they were simply war casualties since it happened during World War One. <laughs> That's... So that's like saying what happened to the Jews is just war casualties. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Even though that was the cause of the war. See, this wasn't the cause of the war. Yeah. There was so much drama going on during World War One. They were like, well, we might as well take out the Armenians. We don't like them. We've got these guns. We've got this power. We've also got uh, this train from Germany and this, this railroad that's been built. So Germany built this railroad from Berlin to Baghdad. Mm-hmm. And so Turkey had the railroad. They're like, we might as well just use a train to send them into the desert. Dropped them off in the middle of the desert. and That is so cruel. Yeah. And that was it. And just left them there. No, I'm not going to be able to go to Turkey. Yep. <sighs> we can't go to Turkey. But does it matter? We've got HD drones. and. Yeah. I want to see the world. I do too. But I want to go to a country that accepts me, that welcomes me. So Turkey have been oppressing the Armenian people for decades before this and kept them from gaining any political power, 
keeping them segregated in small groups, not allowing them to have equal rights as the Muslims. So Armenian people were mostly Christian. So even if an Armenian lived in Turkey, their house had to be set at a lower elevation than the lowest elevation of a Muslim. What if the Armenian um, converted to to Islam? I don't think... I think... Was that allowed? You think they would want that, but I think the ties of being born Armenian... Was too much. Having connections with Armenian family members. I think even then they'd just rather you not be there. Okay. But they, they looked at you as, as third-class citizens. You know, they wanted you... Okay, think of the, the, the poorest Muslim in Turkey. You have to be below that person. You can't exceed in any way. You have mm. to stay there. Okay. So that's how extreme they were about it. And it all began with the siege of Van. Van is a city in Turkey. Albanian Ottoman governor Jevdet Bey, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, demanded the city of Van supply him with 4,000 soldiers. It was clear to the Armenian population that his goal was to massacre the able-bodied men of Van so there would be no other defenders. Now, this man, Jevdet Bey, already used his power in nearby villages to search for arms, but in fact to initiate wholesale massacres. The Armenians offered 500 soldiers and exemption money for the rest of the order to buy time. But Jevdet Bey accused the Armenians of rebellion and asserted that his determination to quote-unquote, crush it at all costs. And he said, quote-unquote, if the rebels fire a single shot, I shall kill every Christian man, woman, and, pointing to his knee, every child up to here. So every child up to his knee. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I understand. I'm just lost for words. Yeah. That's... So pretty much he's saying, like, yeah, they're all going to die. Yeah, it's just crazy to me how similar it is to uh, the Nazis. Yeah, well, how they pretty much copied everything, right? Yeah, like if, if you were telling me the story, you didn't tell me what country, I would have been like, oh, that's definitely the Nazis and Hitler. Yeah. Yeah, if I just didn't tell you yeah. their positions and mm-hmm. I just told you the story. And what they were saying, like what that guy said. Yeah, and that's why I felt this topic is very important because we don't know about this. You know, mm-hmm. most people don't know about this even happening. So the next day, the 20th of April, 1915, the siege of Van began when an Armenian woman was harassed and the two Armenian men who came to her aid were killed by Ottoman soldiers. The Armenian defenders protected the 30,000 residents and 15,000 refugees living in the area of roughly one square kilometer of the Armenian quarter and suburb of Ajistan with 1,500 able-bodied riflemen who supplied with 300 rifles, 1,000 pistols and unique weapons. The conflict lasted until General Yudenik of Russia came to their rescue. Reports of the conflict reached the United States ambassador of the Ottoman Empire, Henry Morgenthau Sr. from Aleppo and Van, prompting him to raise the issue in person with Talat and Enver. Or Enver. Now, forgive me if I'm pronouncing things wrong. I'm trying my best. I was thinking that should be the slogan of our show. I'm trying my yeah. best. Oh my God, it should be. Yeah. This year in history, sorry, we're trying our best. <laughs> <laughs> As he quoted to them, the testimonies of the consulate officials, they justified the deportations as necessary to the conduct of the war, suggesting that complicity of the Armenians of Van with the Russian forces that had taken the city justified the persecution of all ethnic Armenians. I mentioned in the summary how there were Armenian intellectuals arrested on the 24th of April, 1915. Mm -hmm. And the following weeks, they were then, of course, deported and killed. So they took pretty much the best of the Armenians, all the high-respected officials, and just killed them all off. That way, make it easier to kill the rest. They have no leadership. They rounded them all up, arrested them, killed them. So, why are they in Turkey? Like, if they live in Turkey, just like how Jewish people lived in Germany, they are kind of a nomadic race. They have a very small country, Armenia, which is mm-hmm. kind of located on the border of Turkey and Georgia, and um, it's a small country. And so they they go to other countries for work. Okay. So they uh, don't really. The, the Turkish people don't like them there, but they're there. They're working. They're doing their part. They're working their job. So oh. it's a lot like how, you know, why why were there Jewish people in Germany? Okay. And they're in Poland. They're in France. Russia. Yeah, they're all over the place. Like Jewish people from Israel. That's Palestine. Are you sure? I see it as Palestine. 
people might not like that. Like the way they don't like the Armenian genocide. Yeah. It's very controversial, but I see it as Palestine. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. The Holy Land. Mm-hmm. Gaza Strip. Yeah. So by 1914, Ottoman authorities had begun a propaganda drive to present Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire as a threat to the empire's security. Making it seem like, oh, well, they might retaliate. They don't like us already. They could shoot at us or bomb us or something. So we need to just get rid of them. They're a threat. Sounds kind of familiar even today, you know. Mm-hmm. With Israel and the Palestine. That too. Yeah. I was thinking, what, maybe four four years ago, four or five years ago, with the whole, no, maybe three years ago, with Muslims were a threat to the country, to the United States. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Some political leader said that. Mm-hmm. And we need to get rid of them. <laughs> I live next to a mosque. And all of the Muslim people around me are really nice. They always give me food. Yeah. So. I remember you had, a, you had a, um, a Muslim family living next door to you. Yeah. And they'd always and, bring me food. Yeah. They didn't even speak English. They, they just showed up with a big platter of food and said, here you go. And like, what the hell? Like, Or when I'd get home with groceries, they'd come out and help me. And I'm just like, you don't have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> it always depends on the person's character because there's, I think, extremists in every group. Yeah. But people like to focus on the extremists and paint the whole group like that. And it's just not true. And it's usually either about money or politics. Always, yeah. So an Ottoman naval officer in the war office described the planning. In order to justify the enormous crime, the requisite propaganda material was thoroughly prepared in Istanbul. It included such statements as, quote unquote, the Armenians are in league with the enemy. Who's the enemy? They will launch an uprising in Istanbul, kill off the Itihadists leaders, and will succeed in opening up the Straits of the Darnelles, or Darnelles, D-A-R-D-A-N-E-L-L-E-S. Someone help me with that. So on the night of the 23rd to the 24th of April 1915, known as Red Sunday, it's always on a Sunday, isn't it? The Russian Revolution, the Irish Revolution, both. And it's always red. Yeah, red, bloody Sunday. Well, the Ottoman government rounded up and imprisoned the estimated 250 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders of the Ottoman capital, Constantinople, and later in those centers, who were moved to two holding centers near Angora, or Ankara. This date coincided with Allied troop landings at Gallipoli after unsuccessful Allied naval attempts to break through the Dardanelles to Constantinople in February and March 1915. Following the passage of Texir Law, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, T-E-H-C-I-R, Tessir, we're trying our best, law. <laughs> On the 29th of May, 1915, the Armenian leaders, except for a few who were unable to return to Constantinople, were gradually deported and assassinated. This date, the 24th of April, is commemorated as a Genocide Remembrance Day by Armenians all around the world. It was a big deal in 2015 when they had the 100 years. I remember that was on the I news. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, they, they did um, protests and uh, they weren't doing really protests. Was, they were bringing recognition to the Armenian genocide. And I remember it was on the news. I was like, wow, this is on the news. You know, it was like American news all over the place. So that was that was big news then. That was the 24th of April, nine, 2015. Mm-hmm. In May 1915, Mehmet Talat Pasha requested that the cabinet and Grand Vizier Said Halim Pasha legalize a measure the deportation of Armenians to other places due to what Talat Pasha called, quote-unquote, the Armenian riots and massacres, which has arisen in a number of places in our country. So they were trying to make it look like, oh, we're victims here. They're rioters and looters and they're destroying our cities. We need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So let's transport them somewhere else. But for all everyone knew, they were just getting transported, but they didn't know what was happening to them. So it's a good way of kind of get rid of these looters and rioters and these bad people who just want to destroy our beautiful homeland yeah and it wasn't like there was social media back then to document what was really happening yeah so even though armenians didn't know what was going on they just knew they were being transported and most of them were told that we're just getting we were getting out of harm's way there's a war going on Mm -hmm. and we're transporting you away because this isn't your war so a lot of them went willingly oh that's that's sinister very sinister yeah however Talat Pasha was referring specifically to events in Van, extending the implementation of the regions in which alleged riots and massacres would affect the security of the war zone of the Caucasus campaign. Later, the scope of deportation was widened in order to include the Armenians in the other provinces. 
On May 29th, 1915, the CUP, Central Committee, which is known as the Committee of Union and Progress, passed the Temporary Law of Deportation, the Tessier Law, I'm going to call it for now, giving the Ottoman government and military authorization to deport anyone it, quote-unquote, sensed as a threat, a uh, threat to national security. That's so vague, they could say anybody's a threat. That's what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah, you're Armenian, you have ties to other Armenians. Um, you're That's a threat. a threat. Yeah. <laughs> wow. As much like in America, not long ago, they said, oh, if you're a Muslim, you're a threat. You might have family connections. Remember when um, Osama bin Laden's daughter was living in the United States? Was she in, in Florida or something? And they had, they had to deport that whole family. They put them on a plane. Do you remember that? I vaguely remember that. I'm sorry. No, I do. I remember that very well on the news. And I think it was... Uh, either his uh, niece or his daughter or something, she was living in the United States. I think she was living in Florida. Mm -hmm. And they took the whole family and put them on a plane. And for all we know, what happened to them? But, oh, we're de deporting them for their safety. What? You you care about their family mm -hmm. that much? But, you know, we all know they end up in Guantanamo Bay or something. No, I don't think they did. No, I'm joking, but I'm being oh, a bit... Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm being a bit sinister. Because we don't know who's there, actually. We no yeah, one. we don't know who's there. With the implementation of the Tessier Law, the confiscation of Armenian property and the slaughter of Armenians that ensued upon the intactment outraged much of the Western world. So it, news got across the ocean. Mm -hmm. We all knew what was going on. While the Ottoman Empire's wartime allies offered little protest, a wealth of German and Austrian historical documents has since come to attest to witnesses of the horror and the killings, mass starvation of the Armenians. So it was due to the documentation of other countries. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I'll get into what they did to cover it up while it was happening. Because even during that time, the Turkish government didn't want anyone to know what was going on. It was trying to keep it as hush hush as possible. It reminds me of uh, 1905, the first Russian revolution. They only knew about strikes that were happening across Russia because they would have, they had documentation that police were being ordered to go to certain areas, like a large group of police. So that's mm -hmm. how they knew. Yeah. So it sounds something similar like that. Like they try to keep all documentation of an uprising happening, but then they found out about it through a different way. Yeah. The historians did. And I have to say too, when looking at this subject up, you can find a lot of pictures. You can find, you know, documentation of this happening. Mm -hmm. um, pictures of, of starving children, uh, mass graves you, you you see all that i mean a lot of the pictures are from afterwards like the, the the skeleton remains of the armenian people but during that time they kept it so hush hush about what was going on that the ottoman had connections with every photo developer in that empire in that area you know mm -hmm. within the surrounding countries and so it was a law that if you're a photo if you're a person who develops film and you see anything like this, it has a, a relation to that. You have to report it and report the person who sent you the film. And and said, do not do not develop it. Just bring us in and tell us who took the pictures. So they destroyed pictures before they were even developed. Wow. And so we had to rely on people like the Austrians and the Germans to document this and take it back. And that's what most of the pictures are, are journalists and people from the outside. But they made it near impossible. There's trains that went by near these, these killing sites. And they blacked out the windows. So you couldn't even, like, during that commute, mm -hmm. the windows would be blacked out. You couldn't see out the window. And people were like, why can't we see out? We don't want you seeing that. That is so, the only thing I, I could think of is, like, creepy, but, like, real creepy, not, Yeah. I don't know. It's just. It's like you go to any, like, government facility. Or you go on base or something and you can't take pictures of buildings, you know. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, oh, we don't want you selling that to terrorists or something and. But who knows what it is? But we just kind of respect what they tell us, you know. Oh, it's no, they have arrested, um, quote unquote, Chinese tourists. Oh, really? Where they're like, oh, I don't really speak English, and I don't know where I'm going, and they oh, really? go into a room they're not supposed to go in, and they start taking pictures. But it's just like, oh, I'm a tourist. Yeah, that's happened. Oh, I, I'm, I'm and not sure. necessarily on a. It wasn't on a government site when I read it happened. You know how the, our government outsources a lot of um a lot of the work, yeah, like NSA type work. You know, yeah, it was it was something like that, but it's something that were had needed like high clearance. Yeah, I do that. I play dumb a lot. You what? I play dumb. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just oh I didn't know, um, and I, I've gone out of a few things that, for that reason. I went went to go and see my um other in Portugal, and I went to go and see my old house, and 
it used to be a, a U.S. military base. It was kind of a joint base, but now it's like a Portuguese base. And I saw the signs in Portuguese, and uh, I knew it said "Don't go over there" or whatever. But I was like, "I'm going to check out my house." <laughs> and I went there with my camera, had a DSLR Canon, and I'm like zooming in, taking pictures of my my old house. All the vegetation around it's all overgrown. You know, they got trees going out of windows. It's you know kind of abandoned, bound, abandoned housing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Portuguese MPs came up to me and asked me to get off. They came up in a jeep and. And I just said, oh, I'm sorry, I know, I, I, I didn't know, I couldn't read the signs. <laughs> You're like a Chinese. Yeah, story. I was exactly like that because I, it was so beautiful. I have the pictures now and, you know, they were nice enough to let me go and just told me not to take pictures and that was it. But I mean, why not? I already, I've lived here, you know, I've mm-hmm. taken pictures. I've got video of this, you know. But yeah, I, I, I kind of like, you have to play dumb to yeah. get out of it. Like, you can't say, oh, I was, I was trying to infiltrate the housing <laughs> I don't know. What, what, were they, what were they protecting? Anyway, so um, speaking of, in the United States, the New York Times reported almost daily of the mass murder of the Armenian people. This is back then. Don't do it so much anymore, but back then they were. Describing the process as systematic, authorized, and organized by the government, Theodore Roosevelt would later categorize it as the greatest crime of all war. Really? Yeah. World War Two hadn't happened yet. No, this is now. This is oh, 19, 20, 1915. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the great. I think I misquoted it. The greatest crime of the war. He okay. says. Okay. And there is a picture of a newspaper clipping of the New York Times, which reads: Million Armenians killed in ex or in exile. Armenian Committee on Relief says victims of Turks are steadily increasing. As a, the front page of New York Times, and then below that it says: Policy of extermination. More atrocities detailed in support that Turkey is acting deliberately. So, and that was in 1915. Yeah. Wow. So they they were on it. They they knew it was going on. Many journalists were getting in there reporting it. Have you seen what they said about Hitler? No. I'll show you clippings of it when we get to to um, 1942. Yeah. Or whatever. Because <laughs> they weren't that harsh. Yeah. No, they whoa. weren't. Yeah, I was just like, whoa! Like I, when I saw that, I was like can't believe like they said this yeah i wonder what the united states thought of turkey and the ottoman during that time i wonder it's what probably their relations because were. they're brown i was thinking kind of that as well i wasn't sure like maybe because they have more respect for the nazis you know well yeah look at um our history with eugenics yeah uh george w bush's granddaddy um handled the nazi account it was the main guy, one of Ma- Hitler's main guys that handled money. Yeah. George W. Bush's granddaddy handled that account. I forgot what bank it was. We talked about it in the eugenics episode. But yeah, so you could see the difference on the New York Times talking about the Turkish people and then talking about the Nazis. That's why when you said that, I was just like, they really said that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was in the news more so then in 1915 than... As time went on, and they try to like sweep it under the rug, mm-hmm. and you you'll know the, the the Turkish, of course, gained some more political power and and more influence, and you'll even notice that United States actually joins Turkey now to protect them. That's insane. Yeah, to, and they and it wasn't until I think two thousand eight when Obama mentioned that it was called a genocide. Mm-hmm. He announced it as a genocide, and he said that, and that was a big issue because before then America never recognized it as a genocide. So that was a big turning point. It was something rather than nothing. And then also the how Americans viewed the Nazis with Operation Paperclip. They brought ov- over all of the Nazi scientists. They're the ones that got us to the moon. Yeah. Werner von Braun, he was a Nazi scientist. But we'll get to that later on. <laughs> 1958. <laughs> when he dies. I don't know. I'm just making up years. <laughs> So where am I? I'm right here. Okay. So I'm going to get to the death marches now. The Armenians were marched out to the Syrian town of Deir Ez-Zor and the surrounding desert. That's what I was talking about. They marched out to the desert. The Ottoman government deliberately withheld the facilities and supplies that would have been a necessity to sustain life of hundreds of thousands of Armenian deportees during and after their forced march to the Syrian desert. So they purposely didn't feed them they didn't drink water. They're dehydrated, and now they're just dropping them off in the desert to, oh, we're going to relocate you, and left them there just to perish. Executed a few people. 
start telling him, hey, you got dead people in these train uh, cars? Well, start throwing them out. Take them out to the desert. Stop the train for that reason. And then just start get rid of them all. Everyone get off the train. I didn't know what to do. There was nowhere to go. You're thousands of kilometers from, from any city, you know. In or, the middle of the desert. Yeah. That is... And they're already weak. They're, they're starving. They're, uh-huh. They've been without water. There was one day where it was pouring with rain. And they had about 100 people in each boxcar. And they were trying to get water. And that was like, you know, the closest they got to any water was sticking their hand out and, you know, drinking palmfuls of whatever they can get. Mm-hmm. And that was only the people on the sides, you know, people in the middle, just out of luck. So, yeah, they purposely knew what they were doing. And they dropped them off in the desert. And it was pretty much just mass extermination. So witnesses have seen thousands of deported Armenians under tents in the open and caravans on the march, descending to the riverboats in all phases of their miserable life, right? Just They're just going in every way possible. Mm-hmm. Only in a few places does the government issue any rations. Even those were like insufficient. They weren't doing much, but it was something. Mm-hmm. So naturally, the death rate from starvation and sickness was very high and increased by the brutal treatment of the authorities. With few exceptions, no shelter of any kind is provided and... The people are coming out from a cold climate and left under the scorching desert sun without food and water. So temporary relief can only be obtained by a few able to pay officials. So if you had a little bit of money, you could slip them. Maybe you can get some shelter, some food, water. The Turks have embarked upon the quote unquote total extermination of the Armenians in Transcaucasia. That's where Caucasians came from. Tidbit. Rape was an integral part of the genocide. Military commanders told their men to do to women whatever you wish, resulting in widespread sexual abuse. Deportees were displayed naked in Damascus and sold as sex slaves in some areas, including Mosul, according to a report from the German consul there, consulting an important source of income for accompanying soldiers. Dr. Walser Rusler, the German consul in Aleppo, during the genocide, heard from an, quote-unquote, objective Armenian around the quarter of young women, whose appearance was more or less pleasing, were regularly raped by the gendarmes, and that even more beautiful ones, quote-unquote, were violated by 10 to 15 men, the result in girls and women being left behind dying. So like in World War II, before that, they had concentration camps. Mm Mm-hmm. So a network of 25 concentration camps were set up in the Ottoman government to dispose of the Armenians who had survived the deportations to their ultimate point. The network situated in the region of Turkey's present-day borders with Iraq and Syria were directed by Sakrukeya, hope I'm getting that right, one of Talat Pasha's right-hand men. Some of the camps were only temporarily transit points. Others, such as, these are the name of the uh, concentration camps, mm-hmm. Rajo Katma and Azaz were briefly used as mass graves and then vacated by autumn of 1915. Camps such as Leo, Tefriji, Dipsy, Del El, and Raz, Eileen, I'm so sorry about these pronunciations, this is a different language, literally, were built specifically for those whose life expectancy was just a few days. According to the genocide scholar Hilmer Kayser, the Ottoman authorities refused to provide food and water to the victims, increasing the mortality rate. According to the Oxford Handbook of Genocide Studies, Muslims were eager to obtain Armenian women. Authorities registered such marriages, but did not record any deaths of the former Armenian husbands. So, kill the husbands, claim the wife. Mm -hmm. That was a very common thing. So later in 1914... The Ottoman government influenced the direction of a thing called special organization was to take the releasing of criminals from central prisons to be the central elements of this newly formed special organization. According to the Mazhar commissions attached to the tribunal, as soon as November 1914, 124 criminals were released from Bunyan prison, little by little, from the end of 1914 to the beginning of 1915. Hundreds and then thousands of prisoners were freed to form members of this organization. Later, they were charged with escorting the convoys of Armenian deportees. So they had also massacres, mass burnings. So the killings, of course, they did it any way they could. There were mass burnings, there were drownings, there were killing by physicians, morphine overdoses, toxic gas, thyroid inoculation. They killed them in any way possible. Now, much like World War II, they had doctors killing them different ways possible. So this keeps going on and on. Brian... 1924, they've killed one and a half million Armenians. 
And when you even look up like books or films on this subject, they get taken down or threatened by the Turkish government. In the 1930s, there was a book released about the Armenian population on the mountaintop in southern Turkey. And it's a true story about these uh, Armenians that they had guns and they fought off the Turkish people on a mountaintop and survived for 40 days until they were rescued by a French warship. Mm -hmm. And this book is called 40 Days of Masada. MGM was actually going to, they were in production to make a film adaptation of this. And the Turkish government threatened to not only not play any MGM movie in Turkey, but any American film if they were to release that. So there's a lot of pressure yeah. and money talked, you know. So mm -hmm. that, that movie was just canceled and never released. And um, there's so many movies until very recently. There's not been anything else. There's another movie called Amarat. And that movie was threatened to take down, I think, like I mentioned before, there's a movie called The Promise. Uh, another documentary I watched called Intent to Destroy which is part of the definition of genocide and another movie called 1915 which is like a, kind of an artistic adaptation of it mm -hmm. and so in conclusion the turkish government they kind of say okay yes yeah, some bad atrocities happened during that time but we're not going to call it genocide it was pretty much you know people were killed but yeah they lost 1.5 million people but we lost 3 million people 3 million muslims to the war so yeah but the armenians didn't cause the war i know but they were saying it was like it was war you know and these were civilians men women and children that were just executed and we can't go to turkey now and i'm okay with that there's many other countries egypt south korea japan guam New Orleans. Mexico. <laughs> Why are you laughing at Mexico? I'm not laughing at Mexico. I haven't been. I'm embarrassed to say I've never been either. Shouldn't be embarrassed. Yeah, but I'm ex I don't know. Yeah, so that's uh, a small summarized version of the Armenian Genocide 1915. It's very tragic. You see the pictures, you see little clips and there's, there's videos of, of mass graves and pictures of everything and it looks similar to world war one I. i'm world war ii i'm sorry it sounds very similar it's a very dark especially because they're being quiet about it and now the armenian people they don't want them just to be like okay yeah we did it it was a genocide i mean for the turkish government they want to be some sort of punishment for that you know that's a war crime yeah but everyone who did it's already dead yeah but the government can still give them some sort of reparations Maybe give them some land back that they took. Yeah, right. Something. I'll never be good enough. And and you know what? I know some Turkish people. Mm -hmm. You know, Mete, he's one of them. Oh, Mete's Turkish? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. That's his name. I don't want to say his last name. But, yeah, I know, but... But yeah, he's know. he's Turkish, his sister. And um, I've, I know quite a few Turkish people, and they don't deny that it was not a genocide. They, they admit it was genocide. It's the government. Yeah, it's the government mm -hmm. who is a problem. They need to own up and call it genocide. It was. I'm sorry. You know, our ancestors were evil to do that. That shouldn't have happened. We apologize. We, you know, something. Yeah, an apology could go a long way. I mean, it still wouldn't be enough, but it, it could do. I mean, the, the fact good. that they've been hiding it. And if you go to like, if you're in a Turkish ed education system, you'll never even hear about this. Oh, really? They completely... It doesn't even exist in well, Turkish. We didn't even learn it in American. Well, that's true. But, I mean, it happened there. Yeah. You know? And mm -hmm. they won't admit... They, they just ignore it. Like, it never happened. And there, there are some people, quite a... F not too many, but there are some, you know, Holocaust deniers. But you got a whole country of Armenian genocide deniers. It's like if Germany denied... And that's the thing. It. Germany... They owned up to it. And they're ashamed. You can't even yeah. have a German flag flaunting about because it's a nationalistic, you know, frowned upon power move. You don't do it. They're kind of ashamed. Mm -hmm. They have shame in their country and they, they're trying to apologize by <laughs> making nice cars and <laughs> giving it to Oktoberfest. <laughs> you know what the Turkish going to do? Give it symbols for drums. That's all. What else do they do? <laughs> Turkish delights. Those are pretty good. Never had them. Mm. Before we move on, and to what else happened in 1915, I just want to say that if you like our show, please rate and comment on whichever platform you're using to listen to us. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Music, Stitcher. Pocket Cast. We're trying to get on Pandora. Uh, we're not on Pandora? I don't know yet. I thought we were. I'm trying to get there. Well, I haven't got a confirmation yet, but it takes months, I think. 
<laughs> they have to listen to every episode. <laughs> Probably bored them to death. <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> we're trying. This year in history, we're trying to give you some history. We're doing our best. We're doing our best. So what it, else happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, January 1st, World War One, The Royal Navy battleship HMS Formidable is sunk off of Lyme Regis, Dorset, England by the Imperial German Navy U-boat with a loss of 547 in the crew. On January 12th, U.S. House of Representatives rejects proposal to give women right to vote. March 19th, Pluto is photographed for the first time, but is not classified as a planet. Then it was a planet and it's not a planet again, right? Yeah. Can't make up his mind. It's really small. Yeah, it still wasn't a planet then. I still love Pluto, though. On February 12th, Adolf Hitler receives the relatively common Iron Cross second class for b- bravery in World War I. Mm. So, that, that happened. Yeah, he was happy for one day, at least. <laughs> April 11th, Charlie Chaplin's film, The Trap, is released. On March 27th, Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, is arrested and returned to quarantine on North Brother Island, New York, after spending five years evading health authorities and causing several outbreaks of typhoid. So that's all the things that happened in 1915. We'll see you in 1916. Where I tell you about Charlie Chaplin's film was released in 1916. The Trap House. Sequel. Bye. Bye.